for over 40 years, self-serving rule was not followed in federal courts. Um, and here, um, what, what was happening is anything said by Mr. Williams that I tried to get in on cross-examination would be met with an objection that was sustained as self-serving statements. At times, the recused judge, Glanville, would allow it in under the rule of completeness, so 106 and 822, or 24-1-106 and 24-1-822. There were times that he let in, but self-serving statements were excluded, even though they weren't going to innocence, which under the old rule, self-serving statement has to go to innocence. That's why it's self-serving. But anyway, I'm not saying that it's ever going to come up, but it happens so frequently. I just wanted to be cur courteous because that's the way it was going for several months in the court. Um, so I just wanted to raise that to your attention. Um, that's really what it is. In paragraph 11 of that motion, Your Honor, um, it was a, not as much, but under, I think it's uh, 24 8, 801, um, yeah, and I'm looking at 2B, I'm not sure that's right, but I think it's 2B. Um, it deals with a um, statement that's adopted. So, Judge Glambo would allow in, well, this was sent on social media and your client didn't respond, oh no, that's not accurate, or um, there was an alleged meeting and your client was there and he didn't deny it, or somebody else had a lyric in a musical song and your client didn't come back with the next verse and say, oh no, that doesn't apply. And that's not an adoption. An adoption has to be specifically intended to adopt mm -hmm. by your silence. So, so anyway, those are my issues. Okay. They came up a lot. I'm not, Your Honor, I'm not saying that, that the issue is going forward, but it, it like permeated this trial. Okay, I, I appreciate you um, bringing all of that to my attention. And, I mean, this isn't really, I guess this is more bringing it to my attention than anything else. Um, we're not talking about anything specifically right now. And obviously, um, as we're moving forward, we'll check out specifics of things as, I'm going to say as we get to them, although if, if there's evidence that either side knows they're going to be intending to use that might have issues or objections, um, let's try to deal with that to the extent we can before we're in front of the jury. I think I said that already. But, um, you know, I looked at all your case law and I've looked at the statute and um, I don't know whether uh, maybe some people were just using self-serving as sort of shorthand for something, I don't know, but I agree that there is not a, I, that's really no longer the issue. Um, and if something is gonna be excluded, it's not gonna be on the basis that it's self-serving. It's gonna be on the basis that it's hearsay and there's no recognized, codified exception that has been met. Um, so, I mean, that would be my intention going forward is you know to look and see is it hearsay and then if it is, and obviously a prior statement of um, your client is probably gonna be hearsay unless and until he testifies. So the question is gonna be, does it come in under an exception? Is it a prior consistent or prior inconsistent statement? And with regard to adoptive admissions as well, I agree it, it, there has to be something to indicate, not just I heard it and I didn't say no, it has to be I heard it and I didn't in some way dispute it when the circumstances would expect me to dispute it. So yeah, generally speaking, that's my understanding. And like I say, we'll take up the specifics as they come at us. All right. Great, thank you. Yes. I don't know. I think I handed yours back to you before. Okay. So I, 
I knitted or threw my staff or handed you back your copy. I don't know what that is. Okay, understood. All right. Um, the state has a motion to exclude victim character evidence. It was filed on July 23rd, and I don't know if that's something that has been ruled on previously or what this one is really, has that already been dealt with, or where are we on that? It has come up, Your Honor, in the act of the state. The state wanted to file that for the court's guidance for the motions where we were going through specifically Mr. Copeland's redactions. Okay. And there was a couple times, and Judge Glanville overruled the state's objection. He wanted some, what we classify as speculative homicides that the deceased victim, Mr. Thomas, was involved in, that Mr. Copeland speaks about in his interviews. Okay. And so those redaction conversations with the court were after June 12th. So the state foreseeing, forecasting at least that specific issue and or additional questions that may come up wanted to file this motion precluding improper victim character. Okay. And flesh out a little bit more for me. Yes, Your Honor. So Mr. Copeland wanted to testify to and or you all had prior statements where he had mentioned that you wanted to get him, him saying something about homicides that Mr. Thomas had been involved in perpetrating? So, Your Honor, to... Potentially? Yes, Your Honor. And I have some redacting points for you. Okay. So, Your Honor, uh, I've read some examples where Mr. Okay. Copeland, this is what the state wanted to keep out. So... Wanted to keep out. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And the way that the prior, the Honorable Chief Judge Glanville addressed these redactions was, state, let me know what you're not playing. And right. then defense counsel would bring up questions they were going to ask Mr. Okay. Copeland and or play. So there was portions the state was not going to play and defense counsel said they wanted to get into okay. where Mr. Copeland is mentioning there's a murder on Auburn Avenue, there's an individual by the name of Scooter, and it comes up kind of off the cuff of he heard that Nutt had something to do with this murder, and so the state felt that that falls under what's kind of classically a specific bad act of the victim, which can't come in under really any witness to include a deceased victim in a case, and the case law and the state's motion on that is... Um, you know, explains all of that, I feel like, succinctly. And so the state, knowing that we're going to have to go back over these interviews with Mr. Copeland, okay. and some of this may depend on the questions asked and his responses, the state filed this motion. There may be other instances. Those are what came to mind because we recently addressed those, and they're in a recorded statement of Mr. Copeland that the state did not want to play, but defense counsel wanted to ask Mr. Copeland about and or play it if it was impeachment. Under what basis, if y'all had gotten that far, and maybe it's more fair to ask the defense. I, I was going to say that, Your Honor. I will defer to the defense on their basis for that, because I don't want to misspeak okay. All right. Somebody from the defense want to let me know what they might intend to argue with regard to this type of evidence? couple of things. Um, first of all, regarding Mr. Thomas's character in general, um, the state, and, and I defer to the recordings. I don't have it in front of me. I don't, I'm not intentionally misspeaking. My recollection is Ms. Love indicated on January 10, 2015, Mr. Thomas was just hanging out, you know, on the street with his good friends, having a good time, and you know, just having a friendly time, and then these me guys did this thing to him, mm -hmm. um, which was misleading. Um, the but then the state presented witnesses that said that Mr. Thomas was a gang member. This wasn't us. We didn't bring this up. That he's a gang member. That he was a gang leader. And and then they brought in experts and talked about if gang, Inglewood family gang. Bird gang. And these are the gangs that Mr. Thomas was associated with, and, and so uh, 
all this character evidence is really come from the state's witnesses and it's been elicited by the state. Now, regarding what Mr. Atkins just spoke of, I think we're putting the cart a little bit before the horse because these are things that Mr. Copeland said in out-of-court statements. Mm -hmm. I am not conceding. Um, I think, I hope Your Honor is considering the prior argument today about whether um, the statements regarding what Mr. Garlington said, or even Mr. Garlington's statements, alleged statements to Mr. Copeland are even admissible. But then there's another issue. Uh, even if they were admissible, um, Mr. our stance is that Mr. Copeland on the stand, and assuming he testifies um, consistent again, would not deny making those statements. So I don't even know why we're playing prior statements to begin with. All that being said, my recollection of the arguments were that Mr. Copeland was making references to what he knew mm -hmm. about Mr. Thomas as you know a, a gang leader that may have been involved in other violent acts. Um, my recollection of the litigation of that that issue was that um, certain defendants, and it wasn't on behalf of Mr. Stillwell, but certain defendants have argued that Mr. Copeland um, is responsible for the death of Mr. Mr. Thomas. And the argument, as I recall it, was that if that's the defense's theory, that Mr. Copeland's belief and understanding, you gotta remember in context, Mr. Copeland, aside from all the gentlemen here, was embroiled in this this side controversy with Mr. Thomas's brother, uh, Mr. Watts, Calvin Watts. And there was a fight a couple days beforehand at Club Crucial where Mr. Copeland's face was blinded and he was robbed, essentially. Right. So he had this side uh, disagreement going on with these individuals and my recollection of the argument was that Mr. Copeland's knowledge and belief that Mr. Thomas had a history of violence um, created the motive to essentially a preemptive strike. Um, that he knew that he was in a beef and a, and a disagreement with dangerous people and that goes to his motive. Okay, he's Mr. Not, Mr. Copeland. Yeah, who is not alleged to have had by anybody, as far as I can tell from what y'all said to me today, to have had involvement in a Mr. Thomas's murder before the fact. I don't know. That's not been the state's theory, okay. and that has not been Mr. Stillwell's okay. theory, but that did come up. Okay, well, it may be that what Mr. Copeland thinks about Mr. Thomas's violent reputation is entirely irrelevant then. And, and it may, be it may be irrelevant. I'm, okay. you know, I don't want to speak for other counsel, but that's my recollection right. of, of the events. But um, again, I think that, in my personal opinion, the, the, the most prudent thing is to figure out which of these statements are right. even going to be admissible yeah. first. Yeah. But, but in general, Your Honor, the defense is not, you know, we haven't been bringing out evidence about Mr. Thomas. Um, you know, the state laid a, laid a um, video where Mr. Thomas's brother was carrying an assault weapon in a barber shop at the time of the, the shooting. The state's witness said that Mr. Thomas. Okay. Your Honor? Yes. I want to read you, if the court would permit, I found my notes. Just okay. give the court some examples. Sure. So these are from my notes, so the time hack should be pretty close, but for example, in the January 28, 2015 interview of Mr. Copeland at Atlanta Police Department headquarters, right around uh, 7, 48, 13, which is the time that evidence reviewer uses, Detective Dennis asked, what do you know about not having anyone else out there 
I might have missed the word either killed. There was some allusion alluding to that. And Copeland, I have, says, on Cleveland, don't know much about it. What about the boy on Auburn? And Copeland says, who, Scooter? And Detective Gaither, another APDK detective, says, Mr. Copeland, you know, tell us more. You start smiling. And Copeland says, I heard something, but not what was not much. It's just like he did get caught up. Somebody had him killed. So it's that kind of, in the state's opinion, speculative examples of specific conduct. And that's why in the state's brief, and I know the court has reviewed these briefings, a April 2024 Supreme Court of Georgia case, Ward v. State, 318 GA 884. I use in war, it's dealing with kind of the outer limits when someone's claiming self-defense. I like reading Ward, one, because it's the highest court in Georgia, and it's recent, but number two, not being able to use specific acts of the victim mm -hmm. as character evidence, and even a self-defense allegation, which no defendant in this case has alleged that they shot Mr. Thomas in self-defense, um, it still establishes it must be through reputation of the payroll. And so the state's kind of, it's a two-part motion specifically, character of the victim is rarely relevant in a murder trial. And two, if it is relevant, it has to be through reputation or opinion on some salient issue. And three, what Mr. Copeland's discussing about to the state's understanding is quite speculative, even at that. But the state's position is specific bad acts, which murder, you know, I can't think of a more concrete example of a specific bad act of a witness or a deceased victim than murder. So speculating about that, the state feels that's just classic uh, improper under 244404 and 
in artful wording. Okay. Um, and what I said in the amendment, Your Honor, was. Um, did you email the amendment to my chambers? I did. Okay. Yesterday. 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 Okay. Yes. Well, that may be why I haven't seen that, although I've been looking at y'all stop non stop. Um, okay. Point, uh, it's in front of me now, so. Um, so what what our position is, Your Honor, as I state on page three of um, the amendment, is uh, outlining what Georgia's um, statutory requirements are, of course, the court is aware of what OCGA 1716-4C1 requires. Um, and uh, then I go down to uh, subsection C on that same page where um, I cite Aggie versus the state 311 Georgia 340 at 343 and go on to say Georgia's discovery law does not explicitly apply 1716 or C to evidence used simply for the purpose of impeachment. Okay. And then I say it unquestionably applies to um, that second intended purpose used as substantive evidence. And then in section D, Your Honor, I cite two relevant similar uh, federal laws um, pointing out that federal law requires the defense to provide the government with materials that are within the defendant's possession, custody, or control possession, custody, or control, my apologies, where the defendant intends to use the item in the defendant's case in chief at trial. And that's Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure 16B1 Alpha. All right, so it can be used in the state's case in chief and maybe be impeachment evidence, maybe be substantive evidence, maybe be both. It's not where in the trial it comes in that matters. It's whether it's used and intended for use as substantive evidence or not. That is, uh, yes. Okay, so as long as we're all on the same page with that, and I actually do think that um, to the extent anybody might want to take a closer look at what those distinctions are, I think it's Waddell. Yes. where the court actually says, hey, you know what, these, these can be tricky, these can be dicey, here's what it means, here's the difference between the two. So um, I would um, recommend for everybody's reading pleasure um, the court's exposition of that issue in um, the Waddell case. And in this amendment, I did correct uh -huh. Waddell cited. Okay. All right, so we'll follow that law as well. So, um, Your Honor, the real. So, um, yeah, and so I guess you're, I, I don't know if you've got specifics with regard to things that you believe have not been turned over, I that think. exist and haven't been turned over. Well, I, I cite, for example, in these um, amendments to the supplement on page one, um, the first example was recordings that were held by counsel for defendant Williams of an interview uh, conducted with witness, state's witness, Adrian Bean. Um, the evidence that was shown at trial was that uh, Mr. Bean was a co-conspirator with defendant Williams in an intrinsic armed robbery. The state conducted days worth of direct examination of Mr. B, only to learn the weekend before the day cross-examination of Mr. B was to begin, that counsel for defendant Williams had a recording of an interview he had conducted along with his investigator, uh, which had been in counsel's possession since January of 2023 in which Bean claimed that defendant Williams was never involved in the armed robbery and in which Bean claimed that the police told him to put defendant Williams in the crime. Uh, Mr. Williams presented this statement not just as impeachment evidence but as substantive evidence. 
and further based upon information provided um, by being to the state upon information and belief, um, the recording that was given to the state was only a portion of the recorded statement at issue. And we do not have, if there are further statements, if there are further, further recordings, we don't have them. We've not been offered them. Um, we, we don't know what they consisted of. Another example is Defendant Williams has asserted verbally that he is in possession of a video recorded statement of the witness currently on the stand in which that witness reportedly asserts, we killed none, referring to Mr. Donovan Thomas. The state is not in possession of any such recording, is unaware of the existence of one, but as I stated earlier, uh, Mr. Williams has asserted verbally that he has such a statement. Uh, Mr. Copeland, um, as I stated, is currently on the stand and the state has not been given any such recording or been privy to or been able to review any such recording despite a specific and direct request for it. Uh, we assume that Defendant Williams intends to use a recording if one even exists not simply for impeachment purposes, but as substantive evidence. Um, given these explicit and deliberate decisions to withhold material specifically um, that we outlined above, and I will also point um, the court's attention to a similar example of with intentionally holding back material. Um, there were jail recordings of the witness on the stand now, Mr. Copeland, that uh, apparently Defendant Williams has had in his possession for quite some time, long before uh, Mr. Copeland took the stand. And we were um, only around the time that Mr. Copeland took the stand presented with these recordings. We expressed having a problem with being able to access them uh, and we were given another uh, set of recordings that contained some other files that maybe were missing in the first one. Um, but the withholding, the deliberate withholding of these um, items is what has prompted the state to ask the court for relief here. We are not asking the court to exclude late, you know, disclosed discovery. We're not, that's not what we're asking for, but deliberate intentions um, to withhold information that a defendant intends to use both as substantive and impeachment at the same time. Evidence, we're asking for the relief that we have um, referenced in our initial motion. And if the court uh, is not inclined, as we stated on page five of our amendment and supplement to the state's motion to compel, we recognize um, that both Georgia and federal authority instruct that courts employ the least extreme sanction to remedy discovery violations. Um, if the court deems exclusion of a particular piece of evidence too extreme, the court, the state rather, requested the court issue an order directing defendants to permit the state to inspect and copy any and all material that a defendant possesses, which the defendant intends to admit as substantive evidence, even if the material is also impeaching of a witness, and directing that where the proffering defendant intentionally withholds such material, that it be admitted, if at all, solely as impeachment evidence and with a limiting instruction prohibiting the jury from considering a substance of evidence. All right. So, uh, with regard to the three things that you outlined specifically, you now have the recordings of witness B. Is that true? We have one recording of witness Adrian B that apparently was made on an iPhone, but is, um, according to the information that the state received from the witness as he got off the stand that um, may not reflect all of what was taken down. What do you mean by taken down? 
Well, there were, um, as the witness left the stand, he indicated um, that, uh, and, and actually on the stand, he instructed Mr. Steele to keep it 100, um, implying that that's not everything. In other words, that what we were hearing was not everything. The recording itself was kind of degraded, okay. and we were not, um, it did not appear to be one pulled directly off an iPhone the way that an iPhone would, um, the quality of an iPhone recording would be. And I apologize to the court, but there was one more uh, instance. D'Angelo White was a witness that the state uh, put on a stand who represented to the state that Mr. The counsel for defendant Williams recorded the interview or appeared to be recording the interview that he conducted with the Angela White at the Fulton County Jail. We've never received any recording of an interview between counsel or defendant Williams or anybody else uh, conducted at the Fulton County Jail. I believe I heard earlier reference today to, um, I don't know if I heard that that was the subject of um, any ex parte hearings or meetings with the court between counsel for multiple defendants and the court. But um, if there were or are any interviews of D'Angelo White in anyone's possession or that were made, uh, we would believe the state to be in, entitled to them. He was a witness who was examining cross-examined on the stand. So there were four instances. All right, well, um, he already has been examined and cross-examined? Yes. Okay, and no such recording was used? Right. They didn't okay, then why would y'all be entitled to it? It's just an example of something that we wouldn't, um, that we didn't, weren't aware of. I, okay, but y'all aren't yeah. entitled to be aware of every aspect of a defendant's I case. Guess. You are entitled to um, something that would have been a recording that then gets used as substantive evidence, but it sounds like that did not. The court is right. correct. Okay, so that one doesn't matter. matter. Okay. Um, so the Mr. Williams saying he has a video recorded statement of Mr. Copeland saying we kill nut. Um, which he might want to use as substantive evidence, as well as any jail recordings of jail calls of Kenneth Copeland, I guess, with anybody, I would assume. And we have been, y'all got all of those too, right? So we have been provided, these were not jail call recordings uh, from the Fulton County Jail, okay. they were from a different, but we've been provided according to um, Defendant Williams, Counsel for Defendant Williams, we've been provided all that they have, okay. and so if that is the case, then there is no further issue. Okay. Um, that was fine too. Correct. So, um, Mr. Steele and or any other defense attorney, if you have um, recordings or statements or anything like that, that you intend to use as substantive evidence, whether it is in a case you might present later or your or the state's case, um, you I think you know this, but need to disclose that to uh, the state. Now, if it just comes up at the very end of it, oh my gosh, I didn't know I was going to use this, but now I think I want to, then we might have to sort out whether that's in fact what's going on or not. But but. I expect everybody to abide by their discovery obligations. If I end up making a determination that somebody is willfully failing to abide by those obligations, then I will consider sanctions. But I would hope at this point, and with what I've already heard, I haven't really heard anything that I find um, alarming and improper. Um, so. Unless anybody wants to say anything else, I'm just at this point going to say I expect y'all to apply, uh, abide by your discovery obligations. I think the counsel for defendant Williams emphatically stated he does intend to use a video recording that he has in his possession of um, with the witness currently on the stand purportedly saying what he asserted and that he 
we, 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 okay, well, I mean, I can see how that might be impeachment evidence, and I'll have to hear whether and how it might be substantive evidence. Mr. Steele. Thank you. 
you, Your Honor. So I believe that the state has asked you to do what you said um, from the bench about the law that will apply in this case is not accurate under Georgia law. I also, again, I'm not going to continue to repeat. I hope that you would take it the way Judge Lamble did. I have all objections to any proper made by District Attorney Love. They are um, not only wrong, but I'm going to show you why they are no longer wrong. This is the fourth time we're having this in here. I know you're not here privy to this. What Prosecutor Love did not tell you is the Georgia law that I've already handed to them. Judge Glanville has ruled on this three times. Okay. Every time telling the state the same thing, they're wrong. So I'll go through it for the fourth time that this that Miss Love intentionally, I assume, she has a memory of this because she was here. I handle all these cases. So um, I assume that she's doing intentionally. First of all, what she has told you about the case in your reading of Waddell is not accurate. The original case that the state is using is a case from the Fourth Circuit called United States versus Young. Young is what Waddell talks about. If the Honorable Court will look at United States versus Harrod, which should be in your package, I may not have put this in perfect order because one of them are not stapled, but it should you should have the United States. Okay, and Harry is H-A-R-O-Y, and it is um, 2014 U.S. District Lexis, which is L-E-X-I-S, 160233. And what happens in the Harry decision is the district court judge in New Mexico analyzed a beautiful analysis of the Young case. And that starts, Your Honor, on page 11 of 17 of the copy of the Monsanto Report and the parties. And if you can turn to that page, if you don't mind. I'm here. On the left-hand side, the first full paragraph. It reads, in United States versus Young, which is why I the Fourth Circuit did not explain its decision, but held only that the district court did not abuse its discretion. A holding in United States versus Young may be explained by the fact that the Fourth Circuit was applying the previous version of Rule 16, which used the term evidence in chief. Unlike Judge Friedman in United States versus, and I'm just going to spell it if you don't mind, H. SIA. The Fourth Circuit did not define evidence in chief as case in chief. And then it goes through defining case in chief. The advisory note, I said three lines around. The advisory notes, excuse me, the advisory committee notes to the 2002 amendments state that the change from evidence in chief to case in chief may be substantive in nature. The term evidence in chief may have, as the Fourth Circuit held, encompassed both the party's case in chief as well as the party's non-impeachment cross-examinations. Even if the term evidence in chief encompassed all non-impeachment evidence, including cross-examination, this broad term does not mean that the term case in chief does as well. The Fourth Circuit in the United States versus Young indicated that a party's case in chief encompasses the time which the party's calls its first witness until it rests by repeatedly using the term case in chief in that manner. So I tell you this because the Waddell case goes back to the Young case. The Young case is a federal analysis of a rule that we don't have in Georgia. In addition to that, there have been zero circuits following United States versus Young. Georgia has never cited Waddell or Young. But Georgia speaks directly on what our law is. And there's two different cases, Your Honor, with the same name of Green, G-R-E-N. And if you can take a look at 
the first the most recent clean case, which you should have in your package. Yes. And now the court reported this is going to be GREDN, no and it's 368 Georgia Appeal 74, 889 Southeast 2D, 190, 2023. And what the Honorable Judge Pipkin, G-P-I-P-K-I-N, states, and if you're on, you can look at, if you don't mind, at this case in page 3 of 5, a copy of your party, and it's on the court. Footnote 3 is at the bottom left. And it reads, we also agree with appellant. This case was reversed. So let me just take a step back, if I may. What happens is the state did exactly, in the Green case, what, what uh, Ms. Lugs asked me to do here. They said that the lawyer for Mr. Green had evidence for a while, didn't turn it over until the day of trial. The judge excluded it because the quote, and this is the quote, sat on it. Um, too long, therefore the state was prejudiced and um, excluded the evidence. And the Court of Appeals said, you know, there was no there was no evidence of bad faith or prejudice analysis, so we're reversing. But they dropped this footnote. Mm -hmm. And the footnote they wrote, and I'm quoting, we also agree with appellant that it is not all at all clear that the defense failure to timely disclose and others tally the T A L O N S V S note was in fact a discovery violation, given that talent was a state's witness, COCGA section 17-16-7, requiring the production of statements concerning the testimony of witness. That, and it's in italicized, so it's stressed, the party in possession, custody, or control of the statement, and then in italics, intends to call as a witness at trial. I didn't call these witnesses. I don't intend to call these witnesses. The next line goes further, and I, I'll explain it if you don't mind. It's very easy to explain. Yeah. How, however, we assume, I'm just reading the footnote, for purposes of this opinion, that the note was subject to discovery, and we need not resolve the question or address any possible tension between, and then it gives the two code sections that we're dealing with, OCGA 17, 16, 4, little d is in value 1, and OCGA section 17, 16-7. So if we look now, and I should have given this honorable court and the parties a copy of both code sections, OCGA section 17-16-4. If you look at that first, assuming everyone has it, and it starts for the criminally accused obligations under the Discovery Act, and Mr. Williams did, in fact, opt in to discover. And if you look at the copy of the honorable court, and the parties, it starts on um, the very bottom of page two, but it just says B is in Barry, but it really goes over, Your Honor, to page three, and that's where the one was in 17, 16, four, the copy of the And it says that the defendant, within 10 days of timely compliance by the prosecuting attorney, but no later than five days prior to trial, or otherwise ordered by the court, shall permit the prosecuting attorney at a time agreed to by the parties or as ordered by the court to inspect and copy or photographs or photographs, excuse me, books, papers, documents, photographs, tangible objects, audio and video tapes, films and recordings or copies or portions thereof and to inspect and photograph buildings or places which are within the possession, control, custody or control of the defendant and this is where I stress, Your Honor, it's stressed in the footnote, and which the defendant intends to introduce as evidence in the defense case in chief or rebuttal at trial. Your Honor, under um, OCGA section 17-16-7, if you look at that, I'll give you a copy of that to some of the court in the court. Mm -hmm. And that has... <laughs> That has no later than 10 days prior to trial, or at such time as the court permits, or at the time of any post-indictment pretrial evidentiary hearing, other than a bond hearing, the prosecution or the defendant shall produce for the opposing party any statement, a 
Fannie and Bernie's, that is in possession, custody, or control of the state, or prosecution, or in possession, custody, or control of the defendant, or the defendant's counsel. That relates to the subject matter concerning the testimony of the witness, the witness, that the party in possession, custody, or control of that statement, and this is why I stress, intends to call the trial or such post-indictment pre-trial presentation. How do you call these witnesses? So the reason that it is so important is we're just dealing with who's case in chief. Georgia doesn't have the pre-2002 Rule 16 analysis that was done in United States v. Young. This is not even close. Page 5 of 7, and Your Honor, I am now in the other green. So it is G-R-E-E-N versus state, but it's 307 Georgia 171, 835 Southeast 2D 238. It's a 2019 case. No relation that I know of. It's in Division 4. It's on page 5 of 7, like I said. Left-hand side, the last line before the footnotes. Two lines up, actually. It says, however, that is not what Georgia law requires. As provided by the plain language in 1716.4b2, the statute does not require a report to be prepared and made available or served unless the defendant intends to introduce in evidence in the defense, excuse me, excuse me, I apologize, in the defense case in chief or rebuttal the results of the scientific test or experiment. If you go to the next case, which should be, or another case, I don't know if they're in order, but it's Carmichael, Your Honor, which is C-A-R-M-I-C-H-A-E-L versus state. 353 Georgia Appeal 64. That's 836 Southeast 2D 184, 2019 case. And, Your Honor, if you can turn to the top of the page on the court and the parties, page 7 of 8. Your Honor, this is on the left-hand side. The first full paragraph, the counting from the bottom. Nine lines up on the right. I'm quoting from our court, and this is just one case. There's so many. Just before the state rested its case in chief, the trial court instructed the jury that when a stipulation is entered into the facts, as to facts of other parties, you can accept those facts as being true without further proof. My point is, their case in chief is, it's a term of art. It has a distinct meaning. Yes, and if you go back to the Herod case, it's actually fascinating, case three. It's enjoyable, case three. They go through case in chief versus evidence in chief, and they talk about, specifically, all the U.S. Supreme Court cases. It's on page 8 of 17 of the United States versus Herod, Your Honor. It's a well-written, really good job. On the left-hand side, the first full paragraph on page 8 of 17. And the court, the district court in New Mexico wrote, courts have repeatedly used the term case in chief to refer to the part of the trial between the time that a party calls its first witness and when it rests. And then they go through all these United States Supreme Court cases that talk about it, and it's not even an issue. So I, you know, for the fourth time in doing this, the state then has, or the court said it wants to know about Waddle. Waddle is different. Waddle specifically, and I assume that you have the case because I heard you refer to it. I do. So in United States versus Waddle, which is W-A-D-D-E-L-L, and it is 2016 U.S. District, which is D-I-C period, Lexis, L-E-X-I-S, 68748. It was decided and filed on May 25, 2016, by the district court in Southern District of Georgia in the Savannah Division. Your Honor, if you go on it, I'm not saying you have the same copy, so this is on my page. I'm trying to think. 
page 11 is what I'm looking at. It starts out with one fourth by one point. Mm -hmm. okay. The Wydell case, the judge said, no, you don't have to give it over, but if you're lying, that's, I think, I'm not, I'm not saying that's right. Right, right, no, I read it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to be in a lot of trouble with something right. to that effect. But what happened, the, the issue in Wydell was they were talking about a statement given to the accused before the indictment. So it wasn't done under the auspices of work product. It would be lawyer go down and interviews witnesses. What Ms. Love tries to do is, it, I would have a chilling effect. I interview every witness that would talk to me. I interview everybody. And what Ms. Love is saying is, give me your work product. If I'm not going to use it the way I understand the law, unless you tell me differently, I'm not giving it to the state. So that's my understanding as well. So when she says, you know, Mr. White, and I heard what you said, they didn't use it, why would you ever get it? That's exactly right. I hardly cross examine Mr. White. But the state is telling me to give it. They went so far as Ms. Love called our investigator, tried to get involved and break the attorney camp. She told our investigator, she called me, give me any recordings that you have of Mr. Bean and the investigator's skill. So he must have said, I wasn't on the phone. But Ms. Love then reported it to Judge Randall, who said, Mr. Steele's investigators are obstructing this. This is so wrong of the prosecution. Four times I've given the same case. Four times I gave that green case. Four times, three times Judge Randall ruled. In addition to that, there's factual, not only, you know, am I rejecting I, I am never taking Ms. Love's proper. Okay, so she says that I said, I don't talk with Ms. Love, by the way, if you didn't know that. So I never said anything to her. But that I Is said- Is there somebody on the state's case that you are able to talk to? Yeah, okay. Ms. Willis. All right, okay. On the, the second page, and I'm just looking at the amendment to supplement, on page two, in the center of the page, right. and I, I should start above, but I'll get to that if you don't mind. For another example, defendant Williams, I'm, it's me that she's talking about, has asserted verbally that he has a video recorded statement of Kenneth Copeland in which Copeland reported, reportedly asserts, we killed enough, referring to Don the Top. But let me tell you how that happened. I never said that. Ms. Hilton sends an email and says, upon interviewing Kenneth Copeland, we found out that he put out a social media recording that he killed none, or we killed none. It's in writing. Can you please give it to us? We can't find it. The most I may have said, which I don't have a memory of saying anything, is I'm not giving you anything. If I use something, I'll use it in court. That sounds like something I would say. To these prosecutors, to other people, I would say, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to, I don't have to give that to you, and I'm not going to be able to talk about that. I never said, I verbally asserted that I have anything. But if I do, I'm going to say the same thing that I always say. I'm not giving it to them. If you tell me to do it, I'll do whatever, but I'm not going to give them anything because I don't have to. That would be impeachment. Mr. Copeland, before the 12th of June of 2024, specifically was asked, by Ms. Selden, did you kill not? And he said no. That would be impeachment. The um, next one, that I uh, did not give over Mr. Copeland's jail calls until recently. Let, let me tell you the truth. October 2023, I gave jail calls of Mr. Copeland to the state. October 2023. The state doesn't raise this until more recently when Mr. Colton is a witness. They want me to tell them which jail calls am I going to use to impeach the man. I said I'm not going to do it. Judge Randall said you don't have to do it. I'm not going to do it unless you tell me to, but I don't understand how I'm doing this. Thing. And then to stand here and say I just gave it to him is preposterous. In addition to that, then we go to the first one, Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean testified for days. This case, Your Honor, has taken so long. I don't know how long he's on the witness stand. It would not shock me if he was there for three, four days. All he said was, I don't recall. That's what he said. I don't recall. 
did you say this? I don't recall. I don't recall. So the state got in his prior statements to Detective Quinn. Well, I impeached him. He gave me a statement on recording. The state then doesn't ask Mr. Bean in front of the jury, doesn't ask him in front when he's here to be cross-examined. They come up to Judge Glanville ex parte, give him some sort of document that supposedly shows Mr. Bean is scared, which I doubt. This is just me doubt, I have no evidence. And then in the middle of that document says that Brian Steele and his investigators, I'm not quoting, were in a car with Mr. Bean and his son. And Brian Steele was telling Mr. Bean what to say. And his son has that on recording. That never happened. That never happened. But what Ms. Love was allowed to say in front of the jury, believe it or not, did Mr. Steele stop and start that recording? Mr. Bean said, he always says, I don't recall. I, I objected outrageous, outrageous. That just flows right through. The same way Ms. Love stands here today and says, it's, it's hard to hear or whatever her words are, hard to decipher on an Apple iPhone. I, that did not happen. It is offensive. The legal analysis is wrong. There is no distinction in Georgia on substantive or impeachment. What you were told is wrong. And this lawyer knows it because she sat here in court and I did the same thing without being tempered. All right. That's four times. Thank you for clarifying that. Do you have any Georgia law that represents what you have asserted in your motion, an amended motion? Your Honor, that's just it. I have been clear in my amended motion and it wasn't. Yes. And also, I just want to say that no Georgia law. Right. Georgia law does not define, it does not define a case in chief. It does not break it down. We all know what a case in chief is. I mean, don't we? I think we all know what a case in chief is. Is there any support for your assertion that discovery is, reciprocal discovery is required based on the concept of substantive evidence? Your Honor, what I have said and what I maintain is that one, there is an absence and I'll point the court to three different cases, Harris v. Estate 314, Georgia 238 is one. And these are just instances. 238? What did you say? Yes. Three of the other two and what are they going to represent? 307, Georgia 171, which is the 2019 green case that Mr. Steele cited for the court and 146 Georgia App 423, which is Phillips v. Estate. And we've... When is that from? I'm sorry. What year? Oh, just one second, Your Honor. That's a 78 case. Okay, so that one's not relevant. Oh, okay. Because we have a new evidence case since 78, so, okay. And Your Honor, even with respect to the old case, the only thing that I was citing Phillips for was the proposition that in the absence of specific legislative or decisional case law on the particular issue that is at hand in Phillips, we commend the federal rules of criminal procedure, Rule 16, for guidance. All right, well, we've got a specific rule here now, don't we? Well, when you say we have a specific rule, is the court speaking of the discovery statute that says... That's what we're talking about in this motion, right? Right, yes, Your Honor. We are talking about that and the state's position, the state maintained, first of all, let me be real clear, we didn't file a brief. This is the first brief that we have filed where we asserted 
on these things. We have asked that the court require Mr. Steele to turn this stuff over, but we never argued it out. Mr. Steele has stood up and said he's not required to, and he has pointed to the uh, discovery statute. The court has said, okay, yeah, he doesn't. And we put that in our um, motion to the court that the court has previously made a ruling that we thought deserved um, a second look at. Um, Mr. S w Defendant Williams has adopted as his witnesses all the state's witnesses in the witness list that he filed. And so, Your Honor, when we assert based on Waddell, and Waddell also speaks about work product and it makes this distinction between actual history and work product and what the state or is and is not entitled. The state stands on its assertion regarding what the requirements are because of the fact that I understand the court's position that there is no uh, that there is no misunderstanding about what case in chief means in Georgia, but as there was this um, expounding on its meaning in uh, Waddell, I think it's important to to recognize that it has not there's not been a similar sort of expounding in Georgia, and we can all presume or take for granted that it just means. When the defendant when is you're presenting up your witness, case. right? Okay. So, do you have any case law in Georgia, Georgia, that supports the position you took in your motion that uh, reciprocal discovery requirements are triggered based on whether you're presenting something as substantive evidence? That's my question to you. Your Honor, the only. Um, what we have in support of the motion is cited in the um, amendment and in the motion itself. We have not ever presented or represented to the court that there was a Georgia case that addressed this issue. And the um, conclusion that is asserted in the state's filings are the result of the fact that one, from our position, it's not addressed directly that, you know, what case in chief specifically? <laughs> so you are telling me that when our discovery statute says that the defendant is produced to produce um, or permit inspection and copying of whatever it is that they're in possession or control of, which the defendant intends to introduce as evidence in the defense case in chief or rebuttal at the trial, you think that there's some kind of lack of clarity about what that means? Is that well, what you're representing to the court? Yeah, I'm representing that. That was the position that was taken. That was what was uh, analyzed in the cases that we have cited in our amended um, amendment and supplement to our motion to compel. Um, that is, in our position, a, um, a reasonable interpretation. And as we, as we, as I don't, as we've said in our filing, Your Honor, um, there was the requirement in Waddell that anything that was within the defendant's possession, custody, or control, where the defendant intended to use the item in the defendant's case in chief, that that be turned over. The Waddell Court, Your Honor, in analyzing the meaning and understanding of case in chief, as the court correctly pointed out earlier, said that if it is going to be used as both impeachment and substantive evidence, that that constitutes case in chief. From there, we made the assertion, the state's position, that if they intend, if the defense intends, because there's nothing in Georgia law that analyzes it at this level, if the defense intends to introduce evidence as both impeachment and substantive evidence, then they have a duty to disclose it. And that is the origin of the state. And that is the basis for our position of time. And, and have you heard Mr. Steele argue two or three times before um, that that's not at all what Georgia law means? We've not made this argument before. So I don't mean in writing. Y'all have not no, had we have any discussion whatsoever what in front of Judge Glanville about, as I have said in my motion, Your Honor, what we have argued, the state has said 
Your Honor, they have a duty to disclose this. This is stuff that we are entitled. And Mr. Steele has said no, in citing the Georgia statute, he said we do not. I have never asserted, I've never made this distinction. I've never said that it, that case in chief means if it's being presented as impeachment as substantive evidence. I've never made that. I've never made that argument in a written or oral filing. Okay. All right. Well, I would like for you to take your duty of candor to the court with a little bit more seriousness in the future. That's all. Respectfully, I take it very seriously. Okay. So, anyway, we'll be abiding by the discovery requirements set forth in our statutes. And Mr. Steele, thank you for the clarification. All right. I think that brings us to the issue of when we first met, Mr. Sharp had suggested that there might be, well, I don't know if it was Mr. Sharp or Ms. Love, honestly, one or the other. We discussed the possibility that there might be outstanding discovery that maybe actually was required to be produced that either was missing or just hadn't been talked about. And I wanted us to kind of go through in detail what it is that everybody thinks maybe the other side has that they're entitled to that they haven't gotten yet. So, are we in a position to be able to do that now? If not, we can do it tomorrow or the next day and we can move on to we've got other stuff to do too. Which exhibits have actually been admitted? That's an easier one for this afternoon. Which would y'all rather? We've got to do them both, so I don't really care which order we take them in. Okay, so can we do them today? I think Mr. Steele provided sort of as a starting point a list or a chart or a spreadsheet or something of his understanding of what exhibits have actually been admitted. And for us to take this pause is a good time to make sure we're all on the same page about that. And I know that Ms. Weaver, the court reporter, had at least provided to me, but I don't know whether she copied y'all or not, a couple of places based on that chart where she thought she wanted some clarification or she thought maybe it had been talked about but not actually admitted so we can go through all of those. Do y'all have that or do I need to get y'all that? Your Honor, we have that. I believe that that might be a rough draft. We have been keeping a list as well. And we've been referencing the reported proceedings to ensure that we are accurately keeping note of what has been and has been admitted. As I stated earlier, there have been instances where it has been talked about that evidence has been admitted, it has been tendered, and that has not been the case. So we are still, and we would ask the court to allow us to get a little bit further along in checking all of these exhibits. All right, so the question was, do y'all have the kind of response from Ms. Weaver about her take on a couple of discrepancies? Okay. Ms. Hurstfield, could you share that with everybody? And I was hoping that we could do this today. The state is not ready to yet. You know, I want to try to take us to the end of the day because we have a lot of work to do. Maybe there's something else that we still need to cover that we can cover today? Yes, we have here each piece of evidence, and we are comparing our record to the actual physical piece of evidence. 
you know, we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with Mr. Copeland's sort of redo. But are there any other motions that I haven't gotten to yet today or mentioned today that are outstanding? dealing with a large volume of what ought to be motions in limity while in the midst of trial. And still being in any way efficient with the jury's time, you're not, essentially. Okay. All right. That's just not practical. I mean, we're going to change that going forward, and I'm not going to say I need to know everything tomorrow because I know it's a voluminous case, but y'all been putting this case together for two years, and you ought to know, I mean, you clearly know what witnesses you're going to be using, and you've given me, you know, kind of a very broad idea of what exhibits you intend to use with those witnesses, but... I don't know that if, if we're just every other week saying, okay, let's, let's, let's figure out all of the evidentiary issues that have to do with the next two weeks worth of witnesses. We can do that in one day on a Friday. We just can't. So we're not going to be able, I mean, we all know that we've got this week. And we know that uh, the jury has already been told before I became involved that they essentially have the week of, um, what is it, August, August 19th out. So, you know, this week might be taken up pretty much with 
sorting out the two things I just mentioned and then sorting out all of the evidence that goes along with Mr. Copeland, because he's our next witness up. But the week of August 19th, we need to be plowing through a whole lot of other evidence, not just what's coming up in the next two weeks. We need to be covering the next several months, which ought to be, frankly, the end of this trial by them. I mean, it, it should not take another seven months. It shouldn't. Whether it does or not, I don't know. But um, So the state needs to produce in much more detail a much more winnowed down um, a comprehensive list of what the evidence they intend to use with each witness is going to be so that the defense can see it, evaluate it, make whatever evidentiary objections they have to it, and the court can have some time to view the evidence listen to the evidence, whatever the evidence is, and evaluate the evidentiary issues so that we know by the time the witness gets on the stand, here's what is coming in. I mean, to, for the most part, it's a trial, but what's coming in and what has already been excluded. So do I need to be more explicit about that? Or do y'all understand your marching orders? All right. So I, I feel like I need to be more explicit about it, even though I know y'all understand. Um, by the beginning of next week, I want to see, you know, at least the next 30 witnesses worth of evidence, okay? And then maybe by the end of that week, the next 30. Okay? All right. And we're going to plan to be here all of the 19th, and I don't know when else we're taking the breaks, but... Um, Okay, so that's that. Yes. Um, and, and Ms. Adams and I, Attorney Adams and I filed, I think that motion is not only to say, like, with this chemical jail call on social media. I think you just covered that. Well, and you know, in fairness to the state, I do think that when I asked them for that, I said kind of broadly, let me know what evidence. And now I'm asking for it in more detail, just because practically speaking, in the middle of a trial, we've got to sort out what evidence is admissible. And ideally not while the jury's sitting there waiting on us. Okay. I appreciate the specifics will make us better. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so, any other motions? that are still needing to be addressed. And y'all, it's 3.30, and I plan for us to do work until 5.30, and we can take a little break, but I'd really like for us to figure out something that we can make some progress on for the next two hours. So let's take a 10-minute break, be back. Well, it's 3.34. Be back at 3.45, and y'all think in the meantime, all right, what can we use this time productively to do? Thanks. <laughs> 